Here's the Richard Bullock movement. And just giving it an initial inspection before I uh, start tearing into it and taking it apart. And you can see here the, the bells. Uh, it's a lovely original nest of bells, as far as I can see. Hammers all look to be original, haven't been changed. Uh, no real repairs. No repairs that I can see, actually, which must be really unusual. Uh, the cylinder looks to be in very good condition. The pinning is in good condition. One or two pins may have dropped out, um, but we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But uh, yeah, initially it looks to be in excellent condition. Um, one thing that has been changed is the uh, the fly or the fan for the uh, musical side. And I'll bring you in a little bit closer and show you uh, what I mean by that. So this is the fly for the musical side. As you can see, at a minimum, the blades have been changed because aluminium is not a material you would see in a, a clock of this uh, style and date. It's possible that the centre collet is original, looking at that, but uh, maybe they've just um, put smaller blades on to uh, speed up the music, in which case it's not as too big a job to uh, to correct that and 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 change it. They couldn't be too much bigger actually because um, they would interact with the with the barrel. So I don't know. I don't know why they've changed them. But uh, I will be making a uh, a pair of brass ones anyway because uh, I don't like the uh, the aluminium that those have been uh, changed to. So that's one little job that he's doing anyway. This um, this cock looks a little bit unusual, but I'm not going to question its originality until I've taken it off and had a closer look. Uh, it could well be original. It's uh, just a slightly awkward way of having uh, made it by bending it from the uh, from a piece of sheet like that, but. Uh, as I say, I won't um, question it until I've taken it off and had a closer look. You can see the drive for the uh, the cylinder, for the musical cylinder, and you can see the condition of the musical cylinder. Totally original and really rather lovely. And all of the hammer tails, which look to be in excellent condition and the wonderful original bells. Really looking forward to this uh, clock playing the music and unlocking what's on that cylinder. Hello and welcome back to the workshop. This is part two on the series on restoring and conserving the Richard Bullock musical long case clock. I've got as far in this episode as uh, stripping down the movement and having a look at the overall condition of it and seeing what uh, changes have been made to the uh, to the mechanism on the front here, the, um, uh, the musical release mechanism. And I've made one or two uh, little discoveries. Um, I've also found a, uh, uh, a couple of little um, interesting historical tidbits, which are um, repair is marks and uh, marks, uh, other marks that are in um, inside the clock, which I'll uh, just show you now. The uh, the tunes, I put out a, uh, a call on social media uh, for the uh, for information on the tunes because they are on the dial and obviously they're all named on the dial and it's the original cylinder with the original pinning. So in theory, the names written on the dial are the names that are pinned on the cylinder. Obviously, we can verify that when uh, the clock is playing. That will be easy enough to um, to verify. But I uh, I wasn't familiar with all of those tunes myself. Uh, so I put out a, a post on social media just to see if there are any uh, musical historians out there who would be um, more knowledgeable than myself. And um, I got a, a few really, uh, really good responses. And uh, I learned some already about the tunes which has at least given me enough information to go and uh, do some of my own research and uh, and it, it'll all add to the sort of uh, overall picture of this uh, clock. Uh, the tunes are pushing the date of this to around 1780. 
uh, I think we're starting to with the, the dates of the maker and um, the dates that those tunes were uh, were first sort of around. Um, we're looking at around the sort of 80, 1780 uh, period, I think, for this uh, clock. Going back to the uh, repair marks, there is a um, uh, a mark on the top of the uh, the barrel here. Uh, this is the musical barrel, the music side, and uh, this dates the clock again. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'll just use some isopropanol alcohol and uh, just clean off the worst of the uh, the grease. This is basically a process that I will be using on the, on the whole clock later on. Uh, this is not a clock that I want to uh, polish or you know, brighten up too much. I want to sort of conserve the originality of this clock, but I do want it to be mechanically clean. Uh, so I will be hand cleaning this clock and I'll cover all of that process in future videos. But uh, just uh, initially in order to help me read the, uh, the marks and also to help them to pick up on camera, just getting the worst of the grease off with some, with some alcohol is a starting point. So now we've got the uh, the part cleaned off with some alcohol. You can see here there are some marks. And it doesn't come up brilliantly on camera here, but uh, I'm still trying to G decipher exactly what it says. But I'm pretty sure there's a G and then a B, and uh, it could well um, I'm not entirely sure actually. I will. I, I, what I plan to do is photograph it and zoom in and sort of clean it up a little bit to see if I can read it better. But I'm pretty certain that this word here is Ellesmere, which is encouraging because that's obviously the uh, the place that this clock was made on the dial. And then here we have 1785. So with the the fact that it's Ellesmere, it's either a first repair or it could even be dating the, the, the clock's manufacture there. And then January in 1788, that is some work being carried out, I would think. And then a different uh, set of repairers marks here for 1863 and 1866, I think. I'm looking through my camera at the moment, so it makes it even harder to to pick out, but um, yeah, there's some interesting, um, interesting marks there that uh, are helping us to date the, date the clock. Okay, so I'm going to start the disassembly now of the uh, of the movement. I think I'm going to start just by taking the uh, uh, the whole hammer and bell assembly off in one go, because there are two screws in here that uh, allow the whole of that to come off. Then I can put that over to one side and uh, keep it safe. Interestingly, that screw wasn't very tight at all. Okay, so first look with the bell uh, and hammer assembly removed. And you can see the lovely original condition of this clock. Just how you would like to find it. Now, even though there is adjustment available, they've still felt the need to bruise up the, uh, the tops of these to uh, change the depthing of the 
hammer tails with the pins. So uh, I'm not sure whether the adjustment screws are added later to aid the adjustment after they'd found that uh, some adjustment was necessary. I don't think so. I think they are original. So somebody at some point has decided to give it a bit of a um, abuse before they've realized that actually they could adjust it and it wasn't necessary. So that's a bit of a shame. But again, a closer look at the cylinder. You can see the lovely dusty condition. Everything looking really quite crisp and sharp and in good order. So next stage, I think, will be to whip the bell off. When I'm taking a clock like this apart, especially a more complicated clock, I always tend to put the screws back in the hole that they came from, uh, initially anyway. Uh, whilst cleaning the clock at the later stage, I will tend to take them, all the screws and pillars and uh, posts and everything out uh, in order to clean them all up, but I will then put them onto cardboard to keep them organized so I know which screw came from where. But at the moment, it's... Um, uh, it's a good idea just to put the screws back in the hole that they came from. Okay, I think now that I've got some of the top heavy uh, elements out of the way, the uh, the bells and such, uh, I'm going to take the rest of the movement off the seat board so that I can manoeuvre it around a little bit easier. Steel lines, absolutely horrible. Please never fit steel lines to a clock. If you're ever tempted, think of me and do it for me. Fit anything other than steel lines. Pulleys have already been marked up. This has got a W for wind. So it's always worth checking whether you need to add a new set of marks. It's not always uh, necessary to add a new set. What a lovely dusty seat board. I think although the uh, the movement is, is probably uh, not started life with the case that it's in now, it, I don't think it's the, there's any doubt that the, this movement belongs to this seat board. This is the original seat board, and it's a uh, a lovely thing too. Very nice. This little cutout here looks like it's uh, been extended. It probably would have had a bit of uh, uh, cutout, but uh, this looks like it's been extended. Possibly be due to the size of the uh, of the weight and to pull the weight over to the side. I'm not sure, but uh, it may become clear later on. But there's the seat board anyway. As I've just mentioned, please, please don't use steel lines. They might seem like a good idea due to their strength, as in they're not going to break or not going to break easily. But the damage that they do to clocks is can be, sometimes be really nasty. Uh, this clock doesn't look like it's actually run enough. Uh, it's it's doesn't have the look of a clock that's been run every day about it. 
let's put it that way. Uh, so I think we may have got away with it, but um, the, more often than not, you, you actually see this sort of rope weave of the steel line and galvanized line translated to the uh, to the grooves of the of the barrels so you actually see it sort of wearing it's almost sort of cutting a uh, um, a groove like um, uh, like the grooves in a, in a record uh, and it's actually sort of cutting that that wave weave pattern into into these grooves and it's not nice for the clock so Good idea not to use them. That's what I think of them anyway. Okay, so now I can have a little bit of a closer inspection and see what's what, what's working, what isn't working. So what was happening is it's carrying on running and not locking. So what I'll do is I'll just demonstrate. You can see the uh, the locking piece here and the cam or camp wheel for the music. And every time the hoop wheel comes around, it's allowing the uh, potential to drop and lock. And what should be happening is the cam should be preventing it falling far enough. And then when this dropout comes round, it should be allowed to drop into it, which it did on that occasion actually, so that's interesting. Right, so I'm powering up the uh, strike side here with one key and the music side with the other. And you can see here the, the cam, locking cam for the music coming around. Now what should happen is when it's allowed, this piece should drop into the slot to lock and allow the locking on the hoop wheel inside like that. So that's locked everything um, everything off. Now if we come around with the hand, this is me basically moving on the minute hand. So it's released the strike to warn. Now it's also just coming up to the uh, the music as well. So There we go, it's released the music. The music is now being held. Right, so there's a fault here that it doesn't always reliably lock on the music. So we'll need to look into that. Uh, but it seems to be wanting to, to work. Trains are running. Um, everything seems to be, be there okay. But um, what I'll do is, when cleaning it, uh, I will, uh, which actually is a topic I'll, I'll come to shortly, because that's a topic for, uh, for discussion and possibly consternation by some. Uh, the I will go through the each mechanism and make sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. It may be that I decide to reinstate uh, this system here, which I think was probably a uh, flirt system. Uh, so instead of actually lifting the uh, the music out manually, which is what it's doing at the moment, 
uh, off this pin here. I suspect uh, it may have been via this pin here and uh, this pin here, which is currently not doing anything, and that's the barber there uh, operating a flirt, which would have been dragged down and then releasing. So uh, that may be uh, that may be something to look into. But for now, what I'm going to do is uh, pull the uh, all the front work mechanism off the motion work and uh, and see what condition everything's in and see if anything else shouts at me while I'm doing it. Right, I'm just going to uh, take the musical cylinder off now because it's becoming a little bit vulnerable now that uh, I'm working on the movement and I don't want to damage any of the pins. So it's come this far with minimal damage. I would like to preserve it like that. This is a nice spring, return spring, and is... Uh, rather nicely made and quite difficult to make a spring like that nice and thin like that that is has good enough strength to push the cylinder backwards and forwards and this one does it really well Here's a nice little touch, very worthy of note. The cylinder bearings for the uh, for the musical cylinder, rather than it just having to pump backwards and forwards and drag through its bearing, it's actually pivoting, resting on a steel roller. So when it pumps it backwards and forwards, it's actually moving this steel roller here. Let me just zoom in for you on that. So you can see here, there's a steel roller which can uh, which can pivot and the the pivot of the uh, of the musical cylinder which would rotate like this uh, can rotate on this which I assume is hardened steel and then um, when it's being pumped backwards and forwards it's not having to drag on the surface of the brass bush as it would normally it's actually uh, um, rotating on that on that roller which is a really nice touch and uh, it's the same on the other end of the musical cylinder you can see here how it will roll backwards and forwards it's all very gummed up at the moment but uh, we'll address that here's the cylinder removed from the the movement and it looks just as good in my hands as it did on the clock As I say, it's all rather gummed up at the moment. A little bit of wear on the uh, arbors, on the pivots that need uh, needs addressing, but um, nothing too extraordinary. As I pointed out before, there has been the odd change on the way that this, uh, this clock operates. And um, this is what I think has happened. The, at the moment, the configuration is that the, the music is released by a pin here, lifting this piece up here. But if you look, these rivets don't look very nice. Uh, this piece here is not um, brilliant. If I take it off and show you actually, you can see it's not in quite in keeping with the quality of the rest of the clock. And it, it looks like an add-on. Also, there's this pin here, which doesn't look like an add-on, that does look original, which is currently not doing anything. 
So that's one thing. Another thing is the wheel with the pin on it, which is there, doesn't look like any other wheel in the clock. It's much thicker. It's completely different in style and design of the collet and everything else. And the finish, the way it's been grained, spun grained, is completely different to anything else. And the tooth profile, this is a very uh, uh, completely different tooth profile to uh, everything else in the clock. So I don't believe that wheel has anything to do with it. Well, it's to do with it now, but uh, it wasn't originally. Uh, which makes me think that that stub arbor could have been reused and that may well be the stub arbor taken from here. Uh, this would have been where the uh, flirt was. So you wouldn't have had that extra wheel up there. Uh, this would have been the, the last wheel in this little train, just driven off this pinion here. And the pin that's on that is currently not doing anything. That pin, as the motion work rotates around, would have operated a, uh, a flirt mechanism which would have pushed down, charging up a uh, spring, which was down here. It would charge that spring up, and then when it drops off, it would then release the, the flirt, and the momentum of the weight of the, uh, of the flag of the flirt would uh, carry it on and trip the, uh, uh, the musical mechanism. So uh, that's what uh, I believe it had originally. I may yet uh, return it to that system actually because it's a much nicer system and easier to get right than fiddling around with trying to get drop-offs of pins absolutely right um, here. So yeah, I'm thinking out loud, but uh, I, may, I may reinstate that, uh, that mechanism. Also, as a result of changing this mechanism, their strike silent uh, has obviously not then worked because originally the strike silent would have probably come off this hole here and would have just blocked uh, the uh, either the flirt or uh, the potentially this uh, pin on the um, uh, on the top of this lifting piece, stopping it from lifting out. Uh, but that, that pin is actually um, also for the trip release mechanism. So that, that's what that pin has already got a purpose for, but um, it, it probably would have blocked the flirt, I imagine. Um, which again is a much better way of doing it than what they've done, which is to add a piece that goes off inside the plates and um, and blocks up the train, which is really not a very elegant way of doing it. And also means this piece here, the only way of getting it on and off, the reason I haven't taken it off yet, is because you have to sort of bend it all to get it out of the plate, uh, which just seems horrible. So I may yet uh, return it to its original configuration. But I thought it was interesting just to be able to uh, piece together what had happened to it. And um, uh, I can't answer the question as to why it happened to it. Uh, not yet, anyway. I'm not sure it may it may become apparent. But uh, at the moment, it, it just looks like a change, possibly because of a, a damaged part. Or maybe this spring broke, which uh, would be a fairly chunky spring to have to remake. Uh, so, yeah, it could have been that. Uh, it could have been any number of things, but uh, that's the change that's been made anyway. Now, I'm also dying to get a look at the fly. Oh, that's pretty tight. And see uh, what's going on with this as to why that's got aluminium blades on it. I don't think this screw is original to the clock. It doesn't feel very nice at all. Yeah, that's not uh, not original. So I mean, this has been played with this area. This could be original. Looking at it like this, it's been folded, but it's been folded from a from a cast uh, sheet, which in itself is not a particularly pretty thing to do. 
uh, but at the price of brass, you know, needs must. And it was very more than more than ever that was the case back in the 18th century. So, uh, so yeah, I'm I'm happy to believe that that is that is the original uh, part, but uh, not so happy to believe that that screw is uh, is right. So if we then just take the uh, the fly out. Yeah, so the the arbor and the pinion look lovely. Everything looks lovely about it, actually. It all looks correct, apart from the blades being made from aluminium. So all I can think is that they've made it from aluminium in an attempt to speed it up a little bit because they're removing some mass by making it out of a lighter material. But uh, I'm going to... Uh, I mean, it's then set to, they've gone to that trouble, but it's then set to maximum as it's, as the clock has been received to slow it down. I mean, normally you would probably expect to see it like that. So they, uh, they're not set to sort of maximum air break. So I think I'm going to replace those with, um, with brass. which will look much more appropriate, much more in keeping. Okay, so I think I'm going to continue to uh, uh, to strip down the movement and I'll, uh, I'll give you a quick look at it as I uh, take the front plate off. Right then, let's get the uh, front plate off and have a look what's happening inside. I've already taken all of the pins out of the pillars. There are one, two, three, four, five, six pillars on this clock. So we'll just gently ease the top plate off, the front plate off. There we go. Now, just to show you what I meant about the modification that's happened to the strike silent, well, the, the, the go, no, go, yeah, the, the music, no music uh, lever. They, they, they've added this rather unsightly piece to, to block the train against the, um, the release pin on the, um, uh, on the warning wheel. Well, it's the equivalent of a warning wheel on the music, um, but how does one get that off? I mean, to me, that anything that requires bending a bit of wire out of the way to disassemble it is not a satisfactory um, way of going about it, and is certainly not not original. So, uh, I think just to get purely to get rid of that is probably going to make my decision on putting the flirt mechanism back in again. Anyway, here's the uh, the trains for the. Uh, uh, the clock ah lovely we've got some marks at last i've been hunting for some kind of repair marks or any kind of uh, marks to be honest just from a historical perspective um and it looks like there is some on here so uh, i'll have a look at that in a moment but everything looks wonderful and dirty and just how you would want it this is a rather Rather nice uh, component, actually. If that zooms in okay. That's rather nicely made. I like that. Good. Nice original escape wheel. Looks like it's in relatively good condition as well. There's been a repair to this wheel here. Not too bad. 
I might look into whether or not that needs re-repairing to make it nicer or whether or not it can just be left as is. Don't know, we'll see. Another repair mark down here, so that's nice. We'll get zoomed in on that and see what I can see. Just a repair mark on the plate. It looks to me like, I uh, can't quite make out the name, but it's Great Hayward, February the 27th, 1952. So that's obviously a, probably the most recent repair mark, looking at the uh, the condition of it all. Now looking at the movement, as I pointed out with the initial inspection, uh, the flirt mechanism that would have been here with a spring has been taken off and it's been changed. And uh, that's the empty hole for, the, uh, uh, for where the flirt would have been. And this stub arbor is where the wheel, that's a foreign object to this clock, that is currently releasing the music, uh, that's where that lives. Well, if we take that wheel away because it doesn't belong with this clock, unscrew this stub arbor, you can actually see that it threads into threads into the hole. Not not perfectly, but it, it does thread into it. I think it's. I'm pretty certain that it uh, it belongs, and that the threads just need a little bit of uh, tidying up. Now, another thing that uh, makes me believe that is if it will pick up on camera, you can actually get an indication of the ghost of the square of the stub arbor that was in that hole. And that square corresponds pretty exactly to the size of the square on the uh, stub arbor that we've got. So if I decide to reinstate the uh, flirt mechanism, which I'm thinking I probably will at this stage, then uh, we've got the original stub harbour as a starting point. Now talking about ghost on the plate, you can actually see quite clearly on this one, the shape of the tail of the spring. It's almost like it's been drawn around with a pencil. Well, that's actually, uh, I suppose, corrosion, bruising, um, to the brass caused a, a slight pitting effect and uh, you can see here quite clearly this spring going off up here with that being its tail pinhole and screw hole and uh, if you look at some of the other springs that are uh, original to the clock you can see you know very clearly what it would have uh, looked like uh, I'm not 100% certain whether this would have been uh, a brass ste or steel spring. It'd need to be quite strong, but uh, these these springs up here are really substantial for brass springs and are, and are providing quite a lot of, um, of force. So, um, so I'm currently thinking it may have been a, a brass spring like that that was there originally. 
Now these holes here would be stops for the, a stop pin for the spring, and this would be a stop pin for the, uh, for the flirt mechanism itself. Uh, a, a sort of a rest position, if you like. Uh, so that's what they, um, they would have been. You can see, just while we're looking at this shot, the general condition of the clock. It's really, really filthy. Um, but I quite like it when they're, uh, you know, honestly dirty like that and that they, uh, they tell, a, tell a tale. This is the, uh, as well, while we're on this shot, this is the mechanism that uh, is the slider that moves the um, cylinder fore and aft to change between the tunes. But I'll, I'll show you all of that zoomed in on a, uh, on a later episode. This is where we're at at the moment with the movement. You can see the platform with the bells and hammers, the cylinder, the trains. We can put the barrel back where it belongs. And all the parts that all need cleaning. So uh, I'll need to go through all of these parts and uh, clean off all the uh, the gunk. Yeah, you can see here the uh, the dirt that's sort of stuck, it's like sticky dirt that's stuck to the steelwork. I've done a little uh, test just to make sure that the isopropanol will do something. And you can see here it uh, cleans it up quite uh, quite nicely. Just all that's done is taken the, uh, the surface layer of sticky dirt off. As I say, I will cover the process I'm going to use to clean this clock in a later episode. But uh, there we go, so we've got the the, the movement all stripped down and ready to move on to the next stage. Okay, so that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you on the next one.